starting. Thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight um, for our interaction series of programs at Hanford Mills Museum. And as we get started, there we go. Um, I just want to direct you to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. As you have questions, if you have questions, please use that button to submit questions to us and we will um, be sharing them and having a conversation throughout the evening. My name is Kisa Harley and I'm the Education and Curatorial Initiatives Manager at Hanford Mills Museum. And I'm just going to give a very brief introduction to the museum for those of you who are not familiar. We are a historic mill site located in East Meredith, New York. For those of you who are relatively local, we're about 10 miles east of Oneonta. Hanford Mills is a historic, historic mill site. Um, the sawmill was built in 1846 and the business continued to grow and operate through the mid 1960s. The greatest expansions at the mill took place between 1860 and 1900 under DJ Hanford and his sons, Will and Horace. And that's the reason that we're named Hanford Mills Museum. Uh, in addition to the sawmill, we also have a grist mill woodworking shops or they had a grist mill woodworking shops and a retail shop business. And they also operated a dairy farm. Today, we're a historic site with a working mill. Um, it's all water powered and steam powered. And uh, we still use a water wheel and the steam plant to run the sawmill, grist mill, and woodworking machines. And this on your screen that you're seeing is our mission. This was updated in 2010. And as you can see, we've really shifted the mission in 2010 to focus on sustainability. And now I'm going to turn things over to Liz Callahan, our executive director. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. I would like to welcome everyone again to the Interactions Program. Uh, the Interactions Program is a special program funded through the, a Creativity Incubator Grant from the Greater Hudson Heritage Network and the New York State Council on the Arts. And uh, the Interactions uh, have allowed us to explore a variety of um, a, a variety of really kind of multifaceted uh, ideas around uh, how we think about our uh, environment and sustainability, and uh, 
We've done this with the help of Dr. Will Walker from the Cooperstown Graduate Program and some graduate students from the Cooperstown Graduate Program. I would like to specifically thank Anna Minibo, Shia Muggan, Kirby Sondriel, and Sarah Grantham for their help over the last year since we were awarded the Creativity Incubator Grant. And I want to welcome tonight our special guests, Jay Unger and Molly Mason. Many people know them as critically acclaimed and award-winning traditional musicians. Their wonderful music has been featured uh, in, in some really amazing programs and they are um, a real treasure in the field of traditional music. Not everybody knows that Jay Unger and Molly Mason are also the founders of the Ashokan Center. Uh, and the mission of the Ashokan Center is teaching, inspiring, and building community through shared experiences in nature, history, music, and art. And that's why we've invited them here. They, they have some really great perspectives in their very multifaceted activities. Uh, and we can't wait to hear what they have to say in the interaction tonight. And we may even um, be lucky enough to hear a little bit music as the program, a little bit more music as the program goes on as well. So without saying much more, I wanna welcome Jay and Molly and let them do their thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Liz. Thanks so much. It's really wonderful to be here. And um, we're, we're excited, excited to talk to folks and have people ask us questions and play a few tunes along the way. So um, I thought it would make sense, Jay, to have you start um, because you're Okay. Your whole trajectory started a little earlier than mine did. Well, that first, I'll just mention that first piece that you came in. That was live music. It was us. And we were playing a tune that Molly wrote called The Monarch of the Glen and inspired by? By a 19th century painting that was very popular. Like it was on a lot of walls uh, <laughs> in the 19th century. It was re, you know, reprinted, 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 and people bought it and hung it up at their house. And um, it's a, it's a, um, a male deer. It's yeah, it's a buck uh, standing, looking very proudly, you know, with this amazing rack, and and behind him just these fabulous mountains and and uh, trees and forests and a, a very wild place somewhere. I'm not sure where, but really a beautiful picture about nature. So one thing, just as a piece of background, is we chose to play that to kind of exemplify that fiddle music, traditional fiddle music. And there are traditions not just in the rural south. A lot of people think of it as something from the Appalachian Mountains, which it is. But there's New England, there's Quebec, there's uh, Western Canada, there's Sweden and Finland and Ireland, Scotland. There are fiddle traditions in Greece and in Africa. And it, fiddle music is frequently connected to nature, to farming, to agriculture, to community, to bringing people together and to building connections. So uh, that's what it has been for us at the Ashokan Center. I first arrived there in 1980 uh, to run a music and dance camp, which was a weekend long. It was Labor Day weekend. And um, I had been involved in this kind of activity running camps for adults, really adults and families to learn music and dancing and the traditional styles. And we needed a new home and somebody introduced me to the Ashokan Field Campus, which was its name, and it was owned by the State University of New York. And it was the home to the oldest environmental education and outdoor education programs in the state of New York. They began there in the late 60s. 67. Probably 67, yeah. So here I am in 1980, I show up, we do a weekend, Little did I know that 41 years later, I would still be there and that eventually the music and dance camps, which grew to many weeks and weekends, would meld with the outdoor environmental education uh, programs and it would become one. 
and be under a new auspice, the uh, Ashokan Center nonprofit. Uh, just jumping back further, um, the property, like Hanford Mills, is a historic site. It's a, an historic district, actually. And that's a recent designation. But we have on, on the land a 90-foot gorge, which is a great place to learn about the geology of this part of the world because there are deposits that go back 380 million years. Um, the first settlers were Munsee, Lenape Indians. And the uh, next settlers were Europeans, uh, the Bush family and then the Winchell family. And um, why am I going back that far? I'm not sure exactly, but <laughs> It was used for a variety of purposes, but was held by just a small number of families until State University took it over. Then in 2006, uh, the State University uh, decided they no longer wanted to own the place, and it was put up for sale, which would have meant an end to potentially those long-running outdoor environmental ed programs and the music and dance camps. So we, itinerant musicians who had never run a major nonprofit or pulled together the kind of funds that it would take to save this place, kind of stuck our necks out and said, let's try, if we don't try to at least save it from development and bring all this, these beautiful programs together, we'll, we'll really regret it. Uh, well. It all centers around a piece of music, this tune that I wrote in 82, that was inspired by the programs that we were running, uh, the people, the land itself, just the community that built around that music, that land, bringing people into nature. When they drive down the road into the Ashokan Center, there's a true feeling of leaving the kind of hectic bunch of um, responsibilities, let's say, that you have in your daily life behind, especially in those early days when there was no internet, no cell phones. It still creates that illusion today. So um, after the third summer, I wrote this tune, and it was really a personal um, thing. I didn't share it with people at first because it, it brought me to tears whenever I played it, and I didn't understand that yet. I'm not sure I do yet now. But um, it became connected with the Civil War series, uh, became the main theme. Ken Burns loved this piece of music, and we did a lot of work on his early films, and then later after the Civil War series, many others. As a result of that, we wound up at Gettysburg um, for a re, kind of a reenactment of the Gettysburg Address in the early 2000s, around 2003 or 4. The speaker, they always have an honored speaker at these events, was Governor George Pataki of New York. At the end of the, uh, at the end of the um, speaking and the reenacting of the Gettysburg Address, we were asked to play a Shokin farewell. And it was historians who asked us, even though they know it clearly is not from the period, they just loved it so. At the, en at the end of the whole event, Governor Bataki came over to us with a tear in his eye and sa said how much he loved the music. So uh, when the State University was going to sell the property, I wrote him a letter. And I uh, didn't know if it would get to him, but I wrote it. And it, it said, the place that inspired that piece that you love so much is about to be sold by the state of New York. Uh, can you please give us some time to organize and see if we could save the property and save the programs, the environmental programs and the music programs? And he did. He connected us with the Open Space Institute. Um, good things happened. Lots of people came together. But at each juncture, it felt like a Ashokan farewell because it touched hearts, opened people's hearts and minds to the fact that Molly and I, 
inexperienced in this world could potentially bring this together and make it happen. So I think it was, uh, if we call that a form of st sustainability, the fact that we're able to save that uh, historic site and nature preserve, uh, this piece of music that grew right out of it um, was uh, conceived because of that place was instrumental, no pun intended, in saving the property. That's a big story. It was a big story. <laughs> Um, yeah, sustainability and the arts, music and uh, visual arts as well, have always had, you know, strong connections, I think. And, um, you know, we, I think there's different reasons why that is. I'm, I'm not going to go into them. What I am going to do right now is go back in time a bit more and show some really old-time photos in a very um, non-hip way by standing up and doing this. This is Jay in his little cowboy outfit. Can you back it up a little from yeah. there? Yeah. Can you see it? Okay. <laughs> yeah, there we go. All right. Little ukulele in his cowboy hat, which, and then I'm going to switch over to me. And this is about 10 years later on the other side of the country. And there I am on my living room couch playing a ukulele, right? So. Music from the beginning, and this is me about as a, an early teenager, I'm thinking maybe 13, and I am learning to play the guitar from the television, from the TV by watching um, Laura Weber on public television giving guitar lessons, which was really amazing. That's my little brother there, who then, my little brother grew up to be a fiddler, and here we are in our 20s. And that, that picture of me and James, my little brother, having a jam session at our house where we grew up the night before I left to move to the East Coast in 1990, that picture. So it kind of ties in with my story of coming here. Um, I, I went to college and studied environmental education and for many years thought that I was going to end up doing a job that had something to do with environmental education, whether it was work in the park service or uh, teach or, you know, I wasn't really sure. But music kept kind of getting in the way and sucking me to, to different directions. And I always thought, well, this, uh, this music opportunity came up and, and I'll do it for a while. You know, it'll probably, it'll probably die out and, and I'll come back to a real job in the real world, teaching environmental education or whatever. So um, anyway, it, it never happened. I just kept doing music and kept doing music. And at some point in my 30s, I realized, OK, I guess this is what I'm doing. So I better start getting more serious about it. Um, my influences when I was a youngster, learning how to play the guitar from the television there, is that a piece of land right across the road from my house. It was a 10 acre piece of land. And I grew up in Battleground, Washington, a pretty s tiny town, 850 people and out in the woods and uh, see the beautiful mountains in the distance. So this piece of property across the road, which I grew up walking through the woods to a beautiful stream that was, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe two miles or a mile and a half, I can't really tell, into the woods. And I would go there in the summer and um, in the fall. And I just loved this place and I had grown up there. And it was sold when I was a, sometime in my teens, maybe 16 or so, and it was turned into housing development. So the place that I had loved my whole childhood life was not exactly gone, but kind of gone. And that really sent me in a direction that I think made me happy to be at the Ashokan Center years later, this, this place that was preserved, um, you know, 385 acres of woods and hills and creeks and um, swamps and all kinds of wonderful wild rocky places. 
And so that somehow, I think, fulfilled something that had been missing since my teenage years about my beloved 10 acres of woods that had been turned into something else and would never be like it was before. Anyway, so that's part of my connection with, with being interested in um, the environment and sustainability. It's not the whole story, of course. Sustainability is a whole other picture, but... Oh, my. Yeah. We've been together for decades, and I don't think I've heard that story. <laughs> well, there and you it, go. it relates to something that happened to me when I was a kid. Oh. I grew up in the South Bronx in a not very great neighborhood. But just a few blocks north of my neighborhood was a hillside that was still a forest. And this would be in the, around 1950, 51, around then. And uh, I used to, you know, when back in those days, kids who were five or six years old were just sent out the door, go play. So I would wind up in the woods up the, out there with friends, mm -hmm. and it overlooked the Harlem River. And then maybe when I was about eight, they cut, clear cut it and built more apartment buildings. Wow. Same darn yeah, thing. Yeah, kind of similar. Kind of sends you in a certain direction, it doesn't does. it? It does. The, well, other, uh, the other sustainability yeah. thing that I thought about was becoming a musician. And oh, I want to I want to say something before I go on with this, which is anybody out there with questions or comments along the way, please pop them in, and and we will they will get delivered to us. To chat, even if we're just chatting away here, you don't have to be polite and quiet. Um, <laughs> that uh, another thing about sustainability that I feel very connected to by being a musician, or if I was any other kind of an artist, it would be the same. I think is that you, you, you go for what you love, realizing that you might, you might be poor your whole life. You don't know, you know, it's, it's not like a road to success and large bank accounts and, um, you know, easy living for the rest of your life. You just don't know what's going to happen. You could be very poor for a long time, maybe your whole life, but it's so worthwhile to be doing something that you love that that's okay, that's a good thing. So somehow that fits into sustainability and, and needing to learn how to, um, how, to, how to sustain things and how to reuse things and how to not waste things and how to not, uh, not end up with way more stuff than you need. You just take what you need, use what you need, use what you have, use it again if you can fix it and use it again. So it, it really helps with the um, financial life of a musician to be sustainable. So. Great. Well, in, in hearing what you said, I'm reminded also of uh, what, how, how the support that saved the Ashokan Center came together. There are music and dance uh, cultural type programs where people come for a residential week all over the country now. Some of them take place in hotel complexes, some in college campuses, and some in forested nature preserve type sites. I think the fact that that's what, where we wound up um, was an amazing asset. Um, all the buildings were crammed together and were a little too small. Uh, and it forced people to deal with each other, <laughs> to connect with each other. You couldn't just go off and be on, you could go off in the woods and be on your own, but when you wanted to go to meals or when you're in classes, you were pulled together. And as I mentioned, coming down the road into the property, gave you the sense of leaving the outside world behind. So there was a natural tendency because of the connection to nature, the connection to a place that had a long history and connects us to times and people from the past that tended to bring people together and build community. That's why the, the uh, human beings who had been through that experience uh, became donors 
and supported what we were doing and became volunteers, became advisors, became board members uh, when we started our organization in 2006 and seven, and uh, actually made it all happen. Uh, then those little old buildings that were there had to be taken down because, I'll try to make a long story short, uh, the Ashokan Reservoir uh, has to release, right now they're releasing 600 million gallons of water a day because it's turbid and it can't be sent to the city for drinking. That comes right through the center of the Ashokan Center. And the buildings were right along the waterway, the Esopus Creek, the Esopus River. So they were being flooded regularly, at least their basements. Uh, through a, an arrangement with New York City that allowed them to tear the buildings down, we achieved some of the funding and then Open Space Institute and donors helped us build these new sustainable buildings that are designed for low energy use. They're bigger, more comfortable, and uh, low maintenance. And all of that uh, gave us the opportunity to spread out on this huge piece of property. But we learned from our experience in the tight put together place that we originally found that we do not want to spread out on the property. We do not want to create the potential of factions and subgroups. We, we built everything kind of together. Uh, I called it an engine for community, and it seems to be working. Uh, we still are surrounded by nature. We were able to chop down the least forest to do this. We picked an old parking lot as a starting point because it was the ugliest place on the property <laughs> and it already had been uh, an industrial site actually historically um, now as time has gone on music uh, in our lives has connected directly with some of the programming at the Ashokan Center and with some of the other entities around us uh, for instance we were commissioned not that long ago to write a piece of music for the Catskill Interpretive Center, which is a new um, facility connected with the Catskill Center. And maybe we should do that one. Sure. It's a piece of music about the Catskills, and in it we get to mention John Burroughs, who uh, was America's most famous nature writer in the late 19th, early 20th century. And while being a nature writer doesn't make you a rock star today, it kind of did in those days. And uh, it was through writers like him, artists like uh, Frederick Church and uh, the... Um, Hudson River School. The first guy. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, uh, Cole. Thomas Cole yeah. and Frederick Church and the many, many other Hudson River School artists and then the writers uh, that helped really build the environmental movement in America. So here's a little song for the Catskill Interpretive Center, and maybe you could sing on the chorus. It's too wordy, I have to say. Sky above and the hills below. The 
summer rolling thunderstorms, the winter snow. Come walk the trails and soothe your soul. And let those rippling Catskill waters make you whole. Now, old John Burroughs, he wrote about these hills. Birds are singing in the trees, the leaves are dancing in the breeze. He taught us how to love our Catskill home. The sky above and the hills below, summer's rolling thunderstorms, the winter's snow. For our children and for their children too. The woodland trails, the mountain peaks, the scenic views. So won't you come with me and walk the land? We'll sing a song as hand in hand we celebrate our Catskill Mountain home. Last time. Sky above and the hills below, the summer's rolling thunderstorms, the winter snow. Come walk the trails and soothe your soul, and let those rippling Catskill waters make you. Catskill Mountain Home. Thank you. You know, I was just thinking while we were doing that to uh, also mention what does it mean to have environmental outdoor ed programs at the Ashokan Center? Well, for the many decades, for more than 50 years, a neighborhood of 5,000 elementary school kids would come every year. In the early days, they'd come for a full week, little groups. Now, uh, in recent years, it's been more two nights, Monday to Friday. No, Monday, I mean, sorry, no. Monday to Wednesday, yeah. Wednesday to Friday. And really have this experience of being in nature. And, and there are history, living history classes as well. One thing that stands out in my mind uh, was one day I went to meet one of the buses that had brought kids up from Long Island. And I was walking amongst them as they were running you know, just surrounding me, over 100 fourth and fifth graders, running toward the opening circle in a field. And uh, one of the kids, as he ran by, said, I can feel the earth beneath my feet. And another one said, I could see the sky and breathe the air. I mean, what could be more gratifying than hearing this? This is on day one. Pretty great. It's not always like that. Sometimes kids will get off the bus on day one and they're wondering, no TV? Uh, we can't have our cell phones? They're, they can't while they're there. But invariably, even those kids, by the time they get to the last day, are saying, I don't want to go, go home. <laughs> <laughs> so it, 
it makes it changes lives uh, and it's not just the program we provide it's the the setting and it's being there in nature and in a place that feels like it hasn't changed a lot over the past many hundreds of years although truly it has if you look at a photo from the early 20th century there are almost no trees on the property and now it's reforested barren hillsides for quite a quite a far distance yeah, in yeah. the old photographs and then the music and dance camp programs are for anywhere from about 75 to 175 people at a time they're multi-generational and they're for everything from a total beginner to professionals and part of what this music about is about I, I mentioned earlier that a lot of fiddle music is related to uh, nature and farming and agriculture and inspired by such things it's it's about connection and it's about bringing people together and uh, that's why it's still alive today uh, it's not top 40 and it's not highly commercial but when people experience it it, it has a life-changing uh, effect and for some people it's just momentary and others the path of what they do with themselves is altered and one of the things i like to think about both the outdoor environmental ed programs and the music and dance programs which are all coming closer together as time goes on. Yeah, I wanted to talk when about I, that a I, little I, bit. You got to finish oh, that yeah. thought? Okay. Yeah, one thing about it is when people leave, we encourage them to take that feeling with them and share it. And what has come of that is it has spawned other events and other gatherings, be they just a community jam session or people who go back to their school and they start a composting program. But whatever it is, I like to call it a Ponzi scheme for good. <laughs> so I was gonna go back to the Ashokan Field Campus started by SUNY Newpaltz in 1967. And they uh, ran a number of years. And in 1980, that's when, of course, Jay said he started bringing music camps there with a weekend. Um, and for the next probably 25 years, something like that, uh, the music camps and the environmental ed operated very separately. And we, you know, we took our place in the summer for, for two or three weeks and the school ran during the school year. We had nothing to do with each other. We rented the place in the summer to do our music camps. When the college decided to sell the place, it was just not not useful enough to them anymore. Um, in 2006, that's when the, the Ashokan Center was started to keep the environmental ed things going, keep the music going, and try to bring those two together a little bit more, um, what's the word, sustainably maybe? And um, I think one of, the, one of the humorous things to me is that when we took over in 2006, or 2008 is when the, the actual transfer happened between the college and the Ashokan Center and um, our, our, our group of folks. Um, and when that, when that happened, um, we realized that we had to sustain the business. And um, the, thing, the only thing that we knew about business-wise was running music camps, which we've been doing already for 25 years so we just made more music camps and we went over the course of the next few years after 2008 when we when we took it over through the next few years we went from running four things a year which we'd done for a long time three in the summer one at new year's we went from four things a year to 11 things a year 11 music camps a year because that was the only thing that we could know how to put together and create new create a new event that would bring in revenue so 
And beyond revenue, it brought in people and built the community. It so. did. It did. It brought in donors, people who had never been to the place, who loved it, people who loved the environmental education portion of the business that went on and also wanted to support that because they believed in it. So it was anyway, it worked out to be a wonderful thing. And that's, well, that, that opens the door for a couple of questions, actually, we have excellent. that are right along these lines. So the first question um, is, do kids get opportunity for repeat visits? And we might open that up to say, you know, anybody, you know, adults too, uh, do, you, do you see repeat visits? Um, and a related question is, do you ever hear from students later as adults whose lives were changed by their experience at the Ashokan Center? We do a little bit, we do, not as much as I would love, but um, I, I wanna start by saying that um, most of the kids who come for, for the environmental education come from Long Island and the city and Westchester and sometimes New Jersey, places where kids just don't have the woods to run around in. But there are local schools There are too. local schools too who come, but, um, Kids, kids from our local schools are kind of like, yeah, the woods is in my backyard. <laughs> well, I have an answer for that. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. The, the, um, normally, um, if a school brings the fourth grade or they bring the fifth grade, that grade comes every year and it's different kids. There's the occasional school that will bring fourth and fifth, so the fourth graders get to come again. Um, we have run into adults who came to the program in the 70s and tell us stories about how it did change their lives. Perhaps they're now in an environmental uh, uh, business or a profession related to nature. But uh, there's a new program that we started called Fiddles in the Forest, which is for string ensembles in schools. And uh, the first uh, in, uh, version of this was for two schools in Baltimore, uh, from inner city Baltimore that brought kids up, and they'd, they've done this year after year, fourth through 12th grade. So those kids come back every year until they graduate as 12th graders. And then the music and dance camp part of things, uh, there are people uh, who, there are kids who were I remember th there are people who've been on staff teaching music or dance for us who first arrived in the early 80s uh, in their mother's womb. <laughs> <laughs> and then as small children, they were born into this music and uh, eventually have become proponents, performers and teachers. Also, kids, um, kids who come as a fourth or fifth grader from, you know, a couple hours away, they can come back to our public events with their parents. And that happens not a lot, not a ton, but it does happen where a, a kid whose school from the Bronx came and then he talks his parents into coming up to one of our public Saturday events. And that's always sweet because the kid knows his way around and gets, gets to show his folks. So that, and um, it's a long answer to a short question, but we've now, um, the part that was missing for many years when a school is there or a music camp, the doors are closed, the gates are closed, and the community doesn't have access. Uh, since the Ashokan Center took over after the college, we've been moving more in that direction. And this past uh, couple of years, that's been a, a big focus to be a place for the community. And uh, the pandemic closed that down for a while but now we're having public events for up to 200 people, completely in the out of doors. And uh, next week is a day camp for uh, kids from a community center in Kingston and other kids from the surrounding area. So we're trying to mix people from different backgrounds, different demographics, uh, a lot of diversity is involved. And it's more, uh, we're growing a local side of things. And that's another part of sustainability. But this, the, the question of life changing brings up another song. Uh, when kids are there, Molly and I frequently sing at lunch and get them to sing something with us. And one song that Molly sings just about every time 
is called Homegrown Tomatoes, written by the, <laughs> the great Texas uh, and Nashville songwriter Guy Clark. Mm. And we now have gotten videos back from schools where they've taught it to their whole school. And we've heard from teachers that the kids make verses up on the bus. Well, just the other day, one of our great outdoor educators who uh, came as a yet very young man, and maybe eight years ago, or five or six years ago, went off, you know, to the rest of his life, whatever that would be, uh, got back in touch with us. And I said, Clarence, what are you doing? And he said, I'm homesteading in West Virginia. Uh, me and a friend bought 52 acres here. I said, wow, how did that come to pass? And he said, it's that song, Homegrown Tomatoes. <laughs> I've sung it so many times, and I finally said, I have to grow my own homegrown tomatoes. <laughs> so with that, I think we should do that song for you. Would you do it, Maybe Molly? so sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a, it's a really easy sing-along, unlike the last one. So... <laughs> There's nothing in the world that I like better than making me a sandwich with a homegrown tomato. I'm up in the morning. Plant them in the spring, you eat them all summer, winter time without them, a culinary bummer. Forget all about the sweating and the digging. Each time you go out, they pick you a big one. Homegrown tomatoes, homegrown tomatoes. What, what would life be without homegrown tomatoes? Only two things money can buy. to me. 
the most the most sung song there at the Ashokan Center. Well, I can tell you, my my sister is a an elementary music teacher on Long Island, and she's brought students to the Ashokan Center many times, and oh. she came back singing "Homegrown Tomato." <laughs> so, I've heard that before from her. Fantastic. Another great thing about it is it's a two chord song, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things Wayne's music gets into the outdoor ed programs is we have a wall of ukuleles mm -hmm. and it's pretty easy to learn two chords on the ukulele mm -hmm. <laughs> and do that song yeah we teach kids often were there, there were there were other questions too there's one there's there is a question i've got a question too sure. and actually this is along the lines of the homegrown tomatoes i'm thinking a lot of environmental education centers i believe the ashokan center does this as well i talk about food waste and educate Yes. Uh, students, young people on food, on local food, on food waste, and, and how your local choices can have a big impact globally. So maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Well, what, one of, yeah. Well, I was just going to say that, that that food waste program, which just, you, you know, gets kids to think about it, to think about what they're putting on their plate what they're eating, what they're throwing into the garbage or the compost, which we now have at the end, uh, because you can, you can go your whole life without thinking about that at all. And it, it's amazing what just a couple of days there at Ashokan, um, you know, brings what, what it brings up in the minds of kids because they think about their food, but they think about other things. So it just reminds me of the story of the Woodstock Elementary School a number of years ago. Their kids were so inspired by that little task of doing their measuring how much food they're throwing away at the end of a meal. Uh, they went back to school and they just took that, they ran with that idea. And they ended up, um, you know, getting, getting all kinds of recycling things happening from their, their paper waste in their classroom, their plastic use, usage, they were able to cut down they were able to change things in their dining hall, get more uh, local food in their dining hall and kitchen, less plastic, less garbage. They started a compost heap at their school and a garden. These kids just like, for the whole rest of the year, they, they, they ran with that thought, which was a beautiful thing. And the nugget of that program that does that started many, many years ago before we were there. Yes. And it's measuring the weight of your food waste and and charting it and trying by the end of your stay to get it down as close to zero mm -hmm. as possible. And you know, one of the things that there are all these compostable paper goods in the world, but they're we can't compost them. They have to be industrial composted. So we have now hooked up with an industrial composting company that allows us to put anything that's uh, compostable in. And uh, that allows us to create a much more environmentally sound uh, thing that we do. I, I want to say one more thing about our kitchen and um, praise our chef, uh, Bill Warrens. Um, in the days that the college owned the center, or it wasn't the center then, it was the Ashokan Field Campus, and they bought food related to, to where the college buys food. And it's just a huge, you know, a huge company that who, who knows where they get it all over the, all over the country. Uh, they ship it in in big trucks and that's, you know, that's where their stuff comes from. But when we um, took over from the college and started our own, we took a closer look and, and our wonderful chef uh, buys as, as local as he can. And um, sometimes it's a little pricey to do that. And so, you know, you have to be careful about that, but he serves um, as much local food as he can and our, our milk and our cream and all kinds of our products come from, you know, probably less than 10 miles away. So part of what happens there is people that are not us doing it. Yes. This guy, Bill, <laughs> he's the right guy. And a couple of years ago we hired a, ret uh, a retired school principal who also plays the guitar and sings named Dan Shornstein. And he brought a program to Ashokan called 
the Youth Environmental Sustainability Summit, Youth Empowerment Sustainability Summit. Yes, and uh, this brought in schools from all over the Northeast and Sweden and England as well. And these kids all go back to school with an action plan. And this is ongoing. So he still now has connections to them and they have connections back to the Ashokan Center. And it's the sort of thing that we love and want to support, but could never have made happen ourselves. Yeah. So part of... We've got a whole great team Part of sustainability is having the right people and giving them their lead Mm -hmm. to go and do stuff. Mm -hmm. Kind of a, a, a related question about different programs and connections in the community. Uh, we have a question about how you uh, are able to make your programs affordable to local kids and families. Right. Wow. Well, one of one of the things that we're doing with our public events is we're just making them affordable. Mm-hmm. Regardless, we're, we're not worrying about whether we make money or lose money on those. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's just part of who we are as an organization. Mm-hmm. It's 100% uh, of our board and our employees are behind that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing is to have support from donors. Mm-hmm. We don't get much in the way of foundation support mm-hmm. or grants. And we may be able to do more in that area, but it's mostly been individuals mm-hmm. and uh, occasionally uh, well, we do. We are starting to get some foundation support now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I want to talk just briefly about this this strange past year that we're no, all boy. experiencing. <laughs> um, so we've had no kids there for for over a year now, just a little bit over a year now, and no music groups either. We've had no weddings, no no anything mm-hmm. there, um, you know, except our public events on Saturday with a limited number of people when everybody can be outdoors wearing masks. Mm. So we have been able to open those up and those happen. But um, yeah, it's been well, tough. We moved online. We moved online with our music programs, our music camps, mm. and also with our environmental education. Mm. So they're called virtual field trips and you can find them online at the Ashokan Center, I think. Um, yes. But what I wanted to say is they're very, very affordable compared to True. bringing a group of kids for two overnights or even one overnight, um, which nobody can do now anyway, right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so these, these virtual field trips are, are a godsend, really, because they're part film, partly filmed, and, you know, wonderful things, and you can, you can see the hike and... The instructor talks about what you see on the hike and what's going on in the woods and critters and tracks and trees and all kinds of things. And then live, and then an instructor is live after maybe a 20-minute film, 15-minute film, and the instructor comes on live to talk with a class or with kids. And it's really been a wonderful thing and has allowed so many schools to participate who never have been able to before and also just families at home able to participate who couldn't before so that's a wonderful thing and that's true of the music and dance camps as well um you know in in both cases uh pre-recorded material could be all we're offering but we're we're at we have a commitment that it's going to be live Mm -hmm. and interactive and uh it's actually re- allowed us to reach much wider. There, there are kids in North Carolina taking our virtual field trips. Mm-hmm. And there are people, as Molly mentioned earlier, in Fiji, mm-hmm. actually Australia, mm-hmm. Scandinavia, at music and dance camps and other public events that we do online. Yeah. So it's pretty exciting. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it'll go away. Mm-hmm. Uh, some element of this is going to stick. Well, you're getting a lot of shout outs uh, here. Uh, one uh, attendee has said, uh, Jay and Molly make my time more pleasurable than you can imagine. Oh, they do one, right. a once a week free concert series on Wednesday at 8 p.m. So you've got a fan there, um, Sharon. And uh, 
yeah, so yeah. That, that's why that sign is up there, the quiet room. Right. That's yeah. the name of our one hour. Supposedly, it's usually closer to two hours every Wednesday at 8 p.m. on Facebook Live. Great. And then another one, uh, this is an anonymous attendee, so I'm not sure, but uh, so much respect for what you're doing. I've done for so many years. I'm a veteran of Northern Week and Irish Week, too. Great. Ah, excellent. Yeah. And, and so then, it, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go I'm ahead. I'm just going to say that Northern Week is a reference to uh, our regional camps were regional, and they're still going. Northern mm. Week, Southern Week, and Western and Swing Week. Mm. And then Molly mentioned branching out. We branched out into a guitar camp, a ukulele camp, a family camp, a bluegrass camp. Mm. Uh, so it became, you know, we found different ways to grow. Mm. That's great. And then a question uh, about uh, whether or not Pete Seeger ever made it to Ashokan. He did. Yes, he um, came to one of the summer hoots. I, I'm trying to remember. It's about. Well, it was it was his last summer it was his on the last planet. It was his last summer on the planet. That's right. He, he died the next uh, maybe December, or January. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember. But yep, he performed and did a phenomenal job and loved being there. He, um, he had a real connection to summer camps from his, you know, very early years of, of being a musician and, and a performer and a young man. So he loved camps. He loved the camp scene and loved it at the hoot. And of mm. course we were not closely connected to Pete, but somewhat connected through playing his festival for decades and decades the Hudson River Revival, which you may or may not know about, but mm -hmm. well, it happens every every June for decades and decades. Pete and his wife Toshi met at a square dance in the Catskills. That's true. And uh, I started playing for dances in Putnam County, New York, uh, at a series of dances that were raising money for the McGovern campaign. Mm -hmm. And Pete and Toshi came every time and danced. <laughs> And he sometimes sat in with his uh, banjo. And uh, one of our central band members, John Cohen, was married to his sister, Penny mm. uh, Seeger. And so uh, I got to know him around when he was in his mid-50s. And uh, Toshi, uh, well, we were playing these festivals in the late 70s. I came up with this idea. Well, I've always felt that fiddle music and dancing are like that. There's a connection. And uh, I thought that the Hudson River Revival should have a dance stage. So I proposed it to Toshi, who was the artistic director. And she said, there's no budget for it, but I'll write a check. So she personally funded an outdoor dance floor and funded the uh, this extra stage with artists every year. Uh, I got to be the person who booked it for about 20 years. And when we started the Ashokan music and dance camps, we wanted to use an outdoor pavilion on the Ashokan property for dancing outdoors, because in the summer it can get hot and humid. But it had a door. So uh, Toshi uh, let us truck the Hudson River Revival dance floor up to Ashokan every summer and bring it back. <laughs> and then when the old campus was torn down due to uh, water releases, uh, our daughter Ruth and, and a group of volunteers uh, who were part of the Hoot, this festival that happens twice a year, uh, dismantled part of the old campus before it was dis uh, demolished, some of the old buildings, and they built the first Hoot stage. Uh, mm -hmm. on a beautiful natural amphitheater area. And it was dedicated to Toshi, who had just passed away. There's a plaque on it, and Pete uh, sang on that stage. He read the plaque before he went up. He knew it was the Toshi stage. Mm -hmm. And he told the story of her passing to the audience, mm -hmm. which was the most touching thing we've ever heard. And then while we're all sitting there in tears, he led everyone in a children's song. Hmm. Just the most remarkable human I've ever met. Hmm. 
such great history there. That's so, so um, kind of touching to hear that story and uh, the community built at uh, the Ashokan Center over the years, over the decades. And it's really amazing. So, you know, um, during all that, all that time, the 1980 till now, uh, we have spent a lot of time and, and energy and, and love, you know, pointed at, at the Ashokan Center. But I just wanted to mention that we also had careers and we were recording, you know, CDs and we were going off to Scotland for three weeks once in a while to, to do things over there. And we were touring and getting on airplanes and going to the West Coast and all kinds of different places, Florida and wherever, wherever they would hire us. So it's been a very busy, busy number of decades here. <laughs> Indeed. Trying to keep it all together. This has been a little quieter of a year, and that's kind of nice. Yeah, mm. I've appreciated that. Yeah. Mm. So many of the things um, you've talked about, and I've made all kinds of little notes to myself as you were talking, really parallel um, so much of what we are about at Hanford Mills, too. And you know, you have been good friends of the mill for a while. And, and, you know, it's always great to see you when you're able to come out and see us. And I've um, enjoyed uh, just one visit to the Ashokan Center. I'm sorry, I haven't gotten there more. We love to go see our neighbor's farms, but can't always get there as, as cultural farmers, right? Well, you're, um, you're always welcome. Remember that. <laughs> but but the, the roots of... Uh, the seeds you're planting, you know, generations of seeds now of, of environmental education and music and, and the, the um, multifaceted kind of uh, cultural and environmental education you're doing are so impressive. But, um, you know, it's, it's the sustainability uh, that, that really intrigues me too. And, and I think that that you know, operational sustainability and teaching kids about their food and teaching kids about the environment, but also using that kind of cultural history through your music as well and um, planting all those seeds. And like you said, you get kids bringing their parents back, you get generations of kids raised at the center, all those little touch points that take root and, and spread kind of like knotweed, <laughs> but, but really it's, it, it's so exciting to see. I wonder, you talked a little bit about the, the, uh, the proximity of the center to the reservoir. And you talked about, Molly mentioned um, early on in the conversation, you know, the, the extensive property and the marshes and the streams and you know, the, the Ashokan, the reservoir and the center are, are very much kind of part of, uh, you know, built around water as Hanford Mills history is too. Um, and, and, you know, one of the kind of feeders for this series was uh, thinking about water justice and sustainability. And certainly the role of the reservoir has a, has a kind of conversation in that. And, um, the uh, the the context of your site has a conversation too. Um, it sounds like uh, do you do any of your programs kind of really explore the water specifically in, in your environmental education? Absolutely. Um, the watershed itself is is uh, one of our programs, the watershed program. And uh, we recently got this sandbox. I don't know if you've ever, I'd never seen anything like it. It's got a uh, computerized projector. You know about this sort of thing. Yeah, and you can make contours and you get a topographic map and uh, you can make it rain and see what water does. It's your own watershed. There. You can recreate a part of the Hudson Valley and then raise the sea level and see what happens. Uh, there, there are those kind of uh, classes. Um, I'm, there's there's, there's the, actual pond study where right. kids go and they take samples. And we have uh, technology is kind of helping us. We can project 
uh, what's in a mic what, what you see in a microscope on a screen so a whole room full of people can see it at once and identify different things the and tiny we, critters yeah. and we just got a grant for an underwater um, uh, what are those things that take pictures from way up in the air uh, drone. drone is an underwater drone cool I'm excited yeah. and that's gonna be we're gonna be able to look at the stream and the ponds from in the in them and record that did you Check have more out. about that no yeah, he says I, they have some really cool toys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we should definitely visit again. After, after saying that we don't we don't do many grants, but that that was one of them. <laughs> it's a good <laughs> couldn't one. Couldn't pass that one up. So. And you know, water. Yes, I I was so impressed with Hanford Mills, and how every aspect of what water power was used for is still happening, and then to realize what water power was. Yes, you know, and still can be how together people were, you know, using it 200 years ago, so 300 years ago. Along the Esopus, there were many, many, many mills. And one of them was at was our dam. And that was first uh, dam. When was that? Molly knows the history on that. Um, probably 1790, right around 1790. That would be the first mill. And, and the gorge was cut by Pleistocene meltwaters. And uh, everything about our history is about water. The mill was closed down because of New York City creating a reservoir. And that changed the, uh, the whole economy of the area. And then uh, we, the college really, one of the reasons they sold the property was these crazy water releases and the fact that it became unstable and they didn't want to have to deal with it. And then those water releases and our negotiations with the city of New York allowed us to build a sustainably designed new facility. It's really interesting how water is at the heart of all of that. And, and, that, and that education and building that appreciation and understanding um, for that, the resource of water, the role of water, in all of your visitors from the students who are coming to right. the people who are um, coming for the music and dance camps and really get that context and they begin to ask questions about why is the reservoir here or you know the role of water as it goes through your site um, certainly educating uh, lots of people who may not have been thinking about that otherwise it, mm -hmm. it makes me think of a dancer, dan people who dance, you know, real, really into contra dancing and square dancing, they need water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they uh, evaporate a lot of water. And one of the dancers wanted a water fountain closer to the dance floor. So he bought us one. And it happens to have a, a, a bottle filling station. And it tells you how many bottles you have saved. And it was no time before we'd saved over 20,000 plastic bottles by having people refill right there. That's and awesome. that's a constant uh, lesson right there. Yeah, yeah. And, and it is, you know, those little lessons your site and our site can provide that we hope people take home and, and yeah it continues to remind them of the role they play. The historic lessons, the environmental immersion you have, um, and, and hopefully that gets carried home and, and becomes part of people's uh, lives and their practices. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the, the water releases are very likely happening. The, the turbidity, which the EPA says can't send this to the city, is very likely because of climate change and the uh, the deeper cuts of uh, yeah. meltwaters and rainwaters and stormwaters into certain soils and or a rock in the Catskills. So that's also part of the picture. Uh, we wouldn't have, the college may not have ever sold it. We would not have had the opportunity to build a sustainably designed uh, facility and on some level, suddenly 
be forced, not kicking and screaming though, to try to uh, have the place be a viable learning center year round, mm -hmm. which is an exciting opportunity, but it's sort of a byproduct of what happened with water. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Well, and you mentioned climate change and the impacts there. You talked about how you could model sea level rise with that uh, neat projection. And, but then, it, you know, it, it's also about noticing these seemingly small changes like the turbidity, you know, it, it, the runoff, right? right. And, and how we're having larger uh, uh, deluges, you know, it, it, and, and the water comes all at once, yes. right? Yeah. And, and what, how these, as Liz said, you know, these smaller localized things, you realize, oh, no, this is part of a global transformation, right? That we're all having to adapt to as humans. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and everything, here, as you're saying, can be a lesson. Yeah. One of our roads is eroding. Mm. It's been there for a very, very long time. There are really big trees that are now in danger because of that. And it's exactly what you're describing. And it's in a very prominent area. So we can use that as a lesson. Demonstration mm. of what's happening. Mm -hmm. mm. Talk about the role of the trees in the kind of prevention of the erosion and or mm. why it isn't working. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. um, yeah. yeah, I think yeah. we do. I think we have another timely tune here. If, Do we? If, if you're up for it. Well, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the water wheel. Oh, sure. Sure. Is Sounds like a good idea? connection. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, yeah, when you, when you uh, right at the beginning of this program tonight, and you were speaking about what goes on there at Hanford Mills and the, the types of mills that that were there and that maybe all, I don't think they're all still there now, but um, those are the mills that we had on, on the Esopus there at Ashokan, a fulling mill and a saw mill and two other kinds of mills, a grain grist. mill, grist mill, and something else that I'm not remembering right now. But that was like what every, every little town and every gathering of houses and homes had back in the day. And that's why so many places developed right around water because they needed that for transportation and for power. Yeah. It also reminded me that in Saugerties, we lived in Saugerties for a number of years until recently. And they of course had, had mills there at the, uh, the uh, where the Esopus enters into the Hudson there and I think in the 50s, they sealed up the mills. The, the old mills had things that maybe could have been, I may be misunderstanding this, but could maybe have been uh, reworked or reused. But in the 1950s, they cemented all, all the openings mm -hmm. up and uh, made them not usable. It just is interesting. <laughs> the mindset of... You know, now we have, now we have all the electricity we could ever want, and so we're never going to do this old time thing again. So we'll just get rid of it, and then here we are in 2021 saying, "Hmm, that would be great if we could do that." <laughs> but water yeah. power, water. Yeah. Power. And while you're getting yourself uh, ready to to do that song. Um, you know, the story you told Jay about kind of having that um, vision of taking over the camp from the college uh, and, and that opportunity to bring your um, music and dance education and, and um, you know, that community into an environmental education setting uh, was kind of reminded me of the vision that um, Ken Kelso, who's the... Uh, gentleman who kind of really was inspired to save the mill in, in the East Meredith community had and eventually got other people on board like you got um, the Open Spaces Institute on board and you know tugged at the governor's heartstrings and things 
um, Ken, Ken was able to uh, do enough to bring attention to the mill to then, you know, have it become a nonprofit with the help of a lot of other uh, concerned groups and individuals. Um, and it goes back to what Molly's saying too, and this is kind of a lead in for you into your song. And, you know, the reason Ken really thought it was important to save the mill is because he had been a businessman and a farmer in Delaware County and in the Catskills for, all, for his whole life. So basically I'd say a good portion of the 20th century. And he saw all the mills and related agricultural industrial buildings disappearing and felt that Hanford Mills was intact and he really wanted to try to preserve it as, as an example of all these places, the places you're talking about in Saugerties and along the Esopus. And, and that's what we always say that Hanford Mills isn't special because of anything the Hanfords did or one particular thing that happened on that site, but it's special because it survives to represent all the other mills that did not because they were so much part of every of every one of these small communities and our growth and development in, in our communities. So exactly. Yeah, that's great. It's yeah. really a parallel story. It is. It is. You, it don't is. Want, you don't want the last one to disappear, you know, nope. you nope. want people to know how, how life was for sure. Yesterday, um, a past director of the Ashokan Center of the field campus was visiting. He lives just down the road. And he was there in 67 when the program started. He was an assistant or a caretaker or something back then. And he sh he's collected so many photographs from before the reservoir was built. And he was showing us photographs of mill after mill on the Esopus. I thought, oh yeah, there was one at Bishop's Falls and one at Winchell's Falls on our property. No, they were constant, yeah. It, very much. Well, on that note, do you want to start with um, Catskill Ramble? Yeah. Well, these are inspired. They're instrumental fiddle tunes that they're dance tunes that are inspired by, you know, well, the names tell you. The first one's called Catskill Ramble. It's in the style of an Irish jig and it's written by Molly. And the second one is called The Water Wheel. And uh, it's more of a kind of a reel. Inspired by, yes, the power, the power of, the of the water turning around and around. Okay. So it'll just go one into the other. Twice? Yeah. Thank you. 
Catskill Rambo and the Water Wheel. <laughs> I hope you could see it turning as we play. <laughs> it's quite something when you go down and they start up that water wheel in Hanford Mills. I, yeah. Every time it takes your breath away. Really does. There's some yeah. power. Yeah. It's and really it doesn't substitute for seeing it in person, um, but we do have some <laughs> videos on our YouTube channel for those of you who may not be able to see it um, or see it anytime soon. But the, the floorboards shake just a little bit. Every, yeah. The whole so, mill comes to life when the water wheel starts up. It is like a living thing. It yes. really is. It's yes. like it, it breathes and oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you'll have to come back and visit. Now I'm really missing being there and seeing that and hearing that. We'll have to visit. Yeah, there's a real music to it. Oh, Liz, you're mm -hmm. muted. I sing. <laughs> Come play the water wheel at the water wheel. Um, That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. I'd love to. You know, what else I think about is I, I would love to get a little bit of footage of that and someday make a little video, an educational video, you know, that shows kids who come to the Ashokan Center what used to be, how it, how it used to work. Because all, yeah. all we have is just, you know. We have the dam. We have the dam and, and we have uh, some falling down parts of, of a, an old brick building, I guess. From... It's a ruin. It's a ruin. It's a ruin. Yeah. We, we, can, we can help you. That happen. Yeah, we can help you with that. <laughs> there are some great, well, I don't know if you want to touch on a few of the other things that have come into the questions. Sure. Um, oh, any, yeah. Anything. You yeah. Got? Yeah. I, well, there are a couple more nice shout outs, you know, Beautiful music, fascinating program. Uh, this was a good one because my dad is the director of a community band. Um, I, this uh, attendee said, as a member of the Delaware County Community Band, I'm always excited when our conductor puts a Shokin farewell on the program. Aww. It's a tremendous piece of music and a hit with the audience. Thank you. I can attest to that because I've played it in, in the Oyster Bay Community Band as well. Oh, what do, what do you um, play, Will? What, what I, is... I, I play saxophone. I also play guitar, but in, yeah. in the community band play sax. Nice. Yeah. And uh, then the last one is uh, how, when did you decide that children's education music was more important than the idea dream of potential fame as a folk pop musician? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Hmm. You know, it happened to me. I mean, it's not just children. I mean, what, what happens at these camps is adults become reconnected with their inner child mm -hmm. and we're all kids together and my daughter who grew up in these camps she says it really beautifully um, adults get to see kids getting serious about learning something and kids get to see adults acting childish or childlike oh that is sweet <laughs> that is cool. I, for me well, it was being on staff at other music and dance camps and just the incredible joy of it, you know, of people of like mind and like interests. And this can happen in any field, but it's, it's all, I, I sometimes call it when you leave something like that, when you've spent an intensive few days or a week in that kind of a setting with the cares of the world erased temporarily, um, and this nice community that form, form, forms, when you leave, it's like you're floating on a cloud of utopian euphoria. <laughs> there you go. There's some lyric. And that's how A Shunken <laughs> Farewell was written, was that cloud dissipated. Mm. And I came back to Earth, and it was just... Mm too much <laughs> for me you know way back like i started teaching guitar at a camp in washington state where i where i grew up in um, i wasn't even out of college yet so you know way back early and i loved it and it, it's for me it it was much more exciting and important to share a piece of information with somebody and you know to show them how to play a chord or to teach them a verse to a song that to me was really exciting, way more exciting than getting on a stage and having people clap at me, which <laughs> always was a combination of scary for being up there in front of people under lights and um, uncomfortable when when they clapped. I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do now? You know, and 
Uh, so, so <laughs> I, I've gotten used to it over the years, She's you know, <laughs> and, and I can do that. I can do that. But I so much would rather sit down with somebody and say, hey, look at this cool thing. You could do it, too. You know, to me, that's really exciting. Planting those seeds for. Yeah other people to yeah. to really engage and and love right. this uh and you know and i i thought about what you were both saying a little while ago about you know traveling to perform so you kind of you you had to make the bacon you had to kind of keep keep working <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. it was working to support your kind of your environmental education habit <laughs> There but doing go. something you love to to do something you love, um, I, you know, I think it's it's what we all kind of do in one way or another to make ends That's meet true. around here. Um, but the things you're doing, I, I thought it was interesting that you touch on Burroughs in the Interpretive Center song, and um, I thought it was really kind of interesting that you referred to Church and Cole too, because in a sense what you're doing at the interpretive center so much carries on the traditions of all of them they were they were kind of the popular culture of their day getting the word out about the beauty of of the catskills and the hudson valley and and um environmental education to the masses um especially as you know urban areas grew and and um some people were more disconnected with the land, not that rural areas weren't still very important, but um, you're really bringing that, you know, into the 21st century, that art and environmental education through whether you're out on the road or at, online at the Ashokan Center or in the big circle that you talked about with all your fourth and fifth graders swimming around you. Yeah. <laughs> that you're, reminded me of yeah. a of a fairly new program. I mean, I guess it's been it's been six or eight years now at the Ashokan Center, but we took one of the one of the little old buildings out in the woods that had been a trapper's cabin way back in the in the sixties and seventies, and they portrayed a, a trapper, you know, and talked about wild animals and stuff. That stopped maybe in the in the nineties or the or the eighties some at some point and didn't happen anymore and it sat just unused for a decade or a decade and a half. Well, we turned it into a writer's cabin and we talked about, now we take kids out there through the woods and we talk about John Burroughs a little bit and, and read, read them, uh, you know, a few uh, choice John Burroughs sentences and talk about where he's from. And then we get the kids to find a spot out, out of the cabin. Hopefully it's a nice day and just to sit down and write in their own little notebook that they bring along with them. And then we, we ask if anybody wants to read it and they will step up on the little porch of the writer's cabin and read. And it's amazing how many kids like, yeah, I wanna read my thing. And you hear these beautiful poems and these beautiful prose pieces and you're like, wow, that came out of that kid? Mm -hmm. You know, really incredible stuff. Just mm -hmm. sitting out in nature for 10 minutes or so and hearing the birds and the breeze and the wind and, you know, it inspires them into beautiful writing. And in, in mentioning the, the music and the art, you're, I was reminded of uh, Will, William Sidney Mount, mm -hmm. a painter from Long Island mm -hmm. who painted people playing fiddles and dancing and he painted, painted uh, uh, African American um, musicians and mm -hmm. farm, people working on farms on Long Island around the 1840s. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we visited the Thomas Cole house and saw his painting studio, a little separate building, there's a fiddle there and a guitar. And we asked about it. It turned out that Thomas Cole and he were friends and Cole would get on the train Come um, up from, I mean, backwards. sorry, uh, Mount would get on the train, right. come up to visit Cole, mm -hmm. and uh, Thomas, I mean, uh, William Sidney Mount was a fiddler, and he collected hundreds of tunes, and he wrote tunes, and they played fiddle tunes together Wow. with uh, Cole on the guitar. Wow. Kind of knocked me out to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> that is, you know, kind of like, 
it's funny to hear that um, Burroughs was friends with Ford and Firestone, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's a, a little more divergent, but <laughs> that's true. That's true. But uh, that's it is very divergent. And it's a reminder that we're all connected, right? True. Yeah. 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 We can be. We can be. That, that was good that that could happen, isn't it? I think it was. Yeah, yeah. It's not where yeah. we are today as a country, but you know, maybe we'll drift back. We'll work on it. Yeah, work on it. And that's that's the goal of so much of I'm sure what you guys are doing and what we're doing at Hanford Mills is yes, helping people to learn how to bridge their differences and and learn from each other and find those common common grounds um, and. Uh, you know, especially as our um, our populations and our audiences and our visitors um, kind of uh, are, come from so many different perspectives. So how how do we find things that that there there's a common um, kind of uh, understanding of? And music is certainly one of them. And our responsibility and our kind of experience in the environment is another. And our Use of resources is another. So, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Put. Yes. Yeah. So true. I think this fundamentally integrated perspective of you talked about dance, you talked about music and art and literature and nature, it all comes together. Right, that, that we can't separate. That's why, you know, Molly, you felt weird being on a stage, just you singing in the audience. You know, this is. This is dance music, right? Made to be performed together. It's participatory, all of this. Yes. So, and, you yeah. know, because of that, um, in our in our live concerts, when whenever we get to do that again, but Jay and I always have sing along, you know, clap to a fiddle tune if you're so inspired, you know, that's a, like a good thing. Um, trying to make the audience feel like they are they are together experiencing something with with their friends, you know, and we're providing the entertainment for them and their friends. So it, it becomes more like a big party where we're all together having a big party instead of instead of something else. <laughs> well, a so, performance. So, so that that's a good entry for you to play us out and get us tapping our toes and okay. bouncing up and down. <laughs> Thank you so much. We, we appreciate everything you've shared with us tonight. It's been a lovely evening and uh, Thank you. we will. Thank you. We enjoyed yeah. it too. We were kind of saving a tune that is not a toe tapper for the Okay. Other. Is that okay? <laughs> That's all right. That's yeah. all right. We're, we're gonna talked about a show can farewell <laughs> so many times. I thought we should play it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it may not be a toe tapper, but it is a tune that goes right to your heart and uh, will be in everybody's head all the way home. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for Thank the you. opportunity to be with you and your visitors. And thanks for everybody who's out there listening. So it's such a pleasure. Thank you very much. Our pleasure.